Um, as well, the other uh, opportunity is we're reducing taxes for small business. And uh, small business generates about 80% of the jobs in, in our economy. So we'll be reducing 2% there. And that should provide lots of opportunity, as well as innovation tax credits for um, furthering uh, uh, clean um, options. Thank you. Well, you may have heard about the Liberal plan for infrastructure investment and the criticism that Mr. Trudeau is taking for planning to go into a deficit for the next three years. But that is an investment in our country, in a country that's confident and proud, and we know that the future will be bright for us. We believe that Canada can be a world leader in environmental solutions, the innovation and sustainability, and that we can be a springboard for economic growth and green jobs. The Liberal government will invest $200 million more annually to create sector-specific environmental-friendly technologies in fisheries, forestry, mining, and agriculture. These strategies will be developed in cooperation with the private sector, with academia, the provinces and territories, so that we can bring these up to commercialization and become world leaders in those technologies that governments and industry support. We will work with the provinces and territories to ensure that we have a full range of support for emerging technology companies. We know that the Government of Canada is the largest employer in the country, the, lar the largest procurer of goods and services, but we're going to make sure and have a policy in place that makes sure that government, policy, government expenditures are green expenditures that the government fleet is converted to electric, electric vehicles. Thank you. Well, as of right now, there are more jobs in Canada in what's called the clean tech sector than there are in the oil sands. Imagine that without any help in the clean tech sector. So the potential for creating jobs is enormous. I just want to, I don't want to quibble with the preamble, but it says providing good jobs for people has been challenging in a competitive world. You know, I don't think we should fall into the frame of the neoliberals. We have long since abandoned having governments that were bold enough to say, why don't we have full employment? I think we need to actually confront this and say, we can create jobs, and we can do it in the, in, uh, in the new economy the green renewable economy. So back to specifics of our platform. We're very concerned with the persistence of youth unemployment, almost twice the national average at 13%. So we put a billion dollars a year giving it to municipalities for community and environmental service core jobs so that young people have the opportunity to get that first job to put on their CV, but in environmental and service projects. We create far more jobs in our climate plan. We have between now and 2020, a billion dollars going into retrofitting buildings like this. 30% uh, of carbon pollution in Canada comes from our buildings. We need to insulate, upgrade, double glaze the windows, and it will unleash an army of carpenters, electricians, and plumbers. Set the third piece is municipal infrastructure, clean municipal infrastructure, I and mean, don't forget McTavish Interchange, that was infrastructure. We need to make sure that we are putting money into public transit, better waterworks, things that reduce carbon pollution, recreational facilities, bike pathways. We're putting the equivalent of one point of GST, 6.4 billion a year, into green infrastructure. And by the way, if you got the flyer from the um, absent chair that claims the Greens are raising GST to do this, we're not. We take one point of existing GST. Thank you. Um, just want to uh, remind everybody that the Conservatives have uh, committed to reducing health transfers to the province, and uh, the Liberals have recently said the same. So $36 billion we're talking about. The NDP is going to reverse that, and we're committing to 200 clinics, 7,000 doctors and healthcare practitioners, 41,000 home care beds, 
a national dementia and Alzheimer's strategy. And uh, we're also uh, investing $100 million for mental health for youth, as well as First Nations. Local jobs at home. Thank you. Well, I take my lead from Mr. Trudeau, who has taken the high road throughout this entire campaign. And I intend to do the same. But I can't, and I have to ask Alicia, where you think you got that number of liberal cuts to health care? That's completely wrong. And it's something we're, we're committed to, fully funding health care. We're not going to do that. Our investments and our, our plan to be to run a deficit for the next three years ensures that we have the money to invest in health care and education. I'm going to take another couple seconds to talk about where else we create green jobs. And one is that the Greens are very committed to improving passenger rail. So we're investing $600 million in the first year, $700 million in the next seven. So it's significant, just by the time we get to 2020, several billion dollars in improving our passenger rail service, which will include Victoria and Courtney daily service. It's yes. time to reduce the call of crawl through the corridor railway. And we're also committed to creating green jobs through um, the investment that we'll be making in the influence. Right. <laughs> Okay, the last question and the last opportunity to have a pre-scripted answer. <laughs> I'm just teasing you all. You're doing fabulously well. Um, the last question is uh, about the fair treatment of next generations. And um, we maintain our present standard of living by using available natural resources. But we're depleting many of those resources and often causing unintended harm. Our present lifestyles may make it harder for our children to live healthy, prosperous lives. This could be seen as a short-term, long-term planning issue. It could also be seen as a moral issue. The seventh generation principle is based on an ancient philosophy, Iroquois philosophy, that decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. Pope Francis wrote in his recent encyclical, intergenerational solidarity is a basic question of justice, since the world we have received also belongs to those who follow us. So the question, what duty, moral or otherwise, do we today have to leave our children and grandchildren do we today have to leave our children and grandchildren the means and the environment to live healthy, prosperous lives? And what would you and your party do to systematically account for the legacy that we owe them? Okay, that's quite a question. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, Alicia, and Tim. It is quite a question, and it's something that I think, uh, well, in a non-political way, I want to recommend to everyone, uh, read Pope Francis' encyclical. It's an incredible document. It's deeply philosophical. It's not all religious, believe me. It's a very interesting document. He takes a direct broadside at waste and greed and our consumer society. It's also interesting that on the heels of Pope Francis' encyclical came similar statements from the organized representation of the Jewish faith and from the Islamic world. There is a coming together of moral leadership that we cannot allow fossil fuels to, and our dependency on them to continue. But we don't need to just look to religious leaders to realize that we are stealing from our children mm -hmm. in continuing the pollution and the destruction of our biosphere. I never thought I'd quote with approval anything said by the head of the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> but at the last meeting in Davos last year, Christine Lagarde said, and I quote, if we don't act on climate change, quote, future generations will be roasted, toasted, fried, and grilled, quote. Now if I had said that, people would say I was some sort of you know, hysterical, hyperbolic, <laughs> Eco-freak, but that was Christine Lagarde, head of the IMF. So, 
What do we do systematically? We embrace the Supreme Court decision and the Chilcote decision. We embrace that Beverly McLaughlin wrote a decision that says First Nations title is collective and intergenerational. And we find a way to apply that across the landscape in a broad way. Because that acceptance of resource use by the Supreme Court of Canada, if we accept this as First Nations territory, means we have no right to destroy it. As a matter of Canadian law, it must be protected and preserved for the use and enjoyment of future generations. We have it, the right to destroy it. The legacy of the Harper and uh, the previous Liberal governments um, have left a debt for our next generation, my children and my grandchildren, the largest social, financial, and environmental debt in history. It's been dumped on their shoulders. And um, the NEP is going to change that priority and make families and youth and seniors the priority. We're going to make every vote count by introducing proportional representation uh, for the next federal election. We're going to put a price we're going to reenact environmental laws uh, that Mr. Harper cut, and unlike the liberals, we're going to enforce them. We're going to provide a leg up on the economic ladder for young people with the internships and co-op placements that I mentioned earlier. Talked about affordable housing and transit and childcare. $100 million into mental health for our youth. These are all going to be helpful. We're going to do that without reducing, or sorry, without increasing personal taxes, and we're not going to run a deficit. What we're going to do is make corporations pay more of their fair share. A two point, sorry, a two percent increase in corporate taxes is going to generate three point seven billion dollars. Other tax loopholes, stock options, is another billion dollars, and. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to rehire those people within the, uh, uh, the public service to go after tax havens. There's an, a, a, a conservative estimate of $200 billion offshore that uh, we think could be better used here in Canada to support your needs and the needs of our communities. Thank you. Disrespected our. Let me, just, let me go through the list. Uh, our planet. Okay, let's start there. Our planet. And that's for now. Our country. Our parliament. Our constitution. Our charter of rights and freedoms. Our Supreme Court. Mr. Harper was the only prime minister in Westminster democracy history who's been charged with contempt of parliament. The list goes on. How he disrespects our veterans. How our veterans who come home from war zones injured, some of them mentally, some of them physically. That's, that's what happened to my nephew. We couldn't get the help we needed for him. He attempted suicide. Fortunately, he survived and is now a successful student. But these are people who gave up their lives, some of them, for our country, for our democracy, for those things I've just talked about. That's not the kind of country I want to see left for our future generations. We need a government who will stand up for Canadians, for the, the pride that we've had. You know, when I've traveled the world extensively, and I've, I've seen how the reaction to saying, yeah, I'm a Canadian, how that's evolved over the last 10 years. You know, it's, it's so different now, and we've got to change. And there's, there's only one way we're going to do that, and that's for all of us to vote. Thank you. Comments, Rebecca, Elizabeth? Well, the comments here, I think we're going to find 
just as you find at this table tonight, that these parties with differences, and we do have differences, goodness knows, we have differences over C51, we have differences over exactly how we go at climate action, but in a minority parliament, I'm able to work with Mr. Trudeau or Mr. Mulcair to make sure that we actually have climate action. And that's why I'm really excited about October 20th and waking up and knowing Stephen Harper is leaving 24 Sussex Drive and we're putting together a collaborative approach. Thank you. 